They spent the summer of 1926 crisscrossing Europe, riding gondolas in Venice, a motorcycle through Paris, and indulging Ted's love of English castles. By year's end, he'd asked Helen Palmer to become his wife. The child inside Ted Geisel also knew what he wanted to be when he grew up. In 1926, Helen Palmer had given Ted Geisel the confidence to drop out of Oxford and pursue a career as a cartoonist. One year later, they found themselves married, living in Manhattan, with Ted earning $75 a week at the leading humor magazine of the day. Ted soon added doctor to his pseudonym explaining straight-faced that it was compensation for the doctorate he never received at Oxford. When it came to his name, the story always changed. He took his mother's name, Seuss, because he was saving Geisel for the day when he wrote the great American novel or history or whatever. He was brilliant. The course of Ted's one-year-old career would change with a single cartoon. A knight confronts his nemesis with the line, Darn it all, another dragon, and just after I sprayed the whole castle with flint. Ted was promptly hired by the Bug Spray's advertising agency. Flit sales soared as his catchphrase, Quick, Henry, the flit, became part of the American vernacular. The Bug Spray's parent company, Standard Oil, turn Ted's imagination loose on other products. I think it's very hard for people today to understand who Ted was in his own time. He was a hugely popular um, figure in, in the media before he really became popular as a children's book writer. Ted capitalized on his fame with a modestly successful mail order business. Fans received mounted creatures made with shells and horns his father had sent him from the Springfield Zoo, which he now ran after Prohibition had closed the Geisel Brewery. Collecting bills isn't an unusual occupation, but collecting bills, beaks, and horns most certainly is. And with them, to create birds and beasts never to be seen outside of a padded cell or the dreams of a whimsical genius, well, that's still more unusual. And Theodore Seuss Geisel of New York is the whimsical genius in question. His most celebrated creation is the blue-green Abelard, which comes to life, but only when nobody is looking. The twin screw ant twerk. The kangaroo bird, so-called because it carries its young in a pouch before eating them on buttered toast. And if it wants an egg, it just lays it. And the Mulberry Street unicorn. Ted's creatures would keep him company, hanging on his studio walls for the rest of his career. At the height of the Depression, Ted's success permitted an annual excursion with Helen that could last for months. In less than a decade, they would visit over 30 countries, returning home from each with at least one fantastic story. You know, Ted would tell me these outrageous tales of, you know, shootouts in a dusty Mexican street and falling into the water trough as the bullet whizzed over his head, you know, kind of thing. And uh, I think, was this a movie or is he thinking, you know? <laughs> In 1936, the course of Ted's life would change again aboard a homeward-bound cruise ship. Ted could not sleep during a storm. Vodka in hand, he began writing a story that harked back to his happy childhood in Springfield, about a boy embellishing the story of his walk home from school. That can't be my story. That's only a start. I'll say that a zebra was pulling that cart. And that is a story that no one can beat. 
when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. If you're trying to teach your child good manners, in the old kind of Victorian sense of that word, you might not think that uh, Mulberry Street is a, such a good example, because it's wild and it talks about fabricating stories. With a roar of its motor, an airplane appears and dumps out confetti while everyone cheers. And that makes a story that's really not bad. But it still could be better. Suppose that I add a Chinese man who eats with sticks, a big magician doing tricks, a ten-foot beard that needs a comb. No time for more. I'm almost home. For I had a story that no one could beat. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. 27 publishers turned the book down, most saying it lacked a moral. When Vanguard Press finally published Mulberry Street, sales were modest, but Peter Rabbit author Beatrix Potter praised it for what she called the truthful simplicity of the untruthfulness. For Ted Geisel, the book's success was bittersweet. The person who had instilled in him a love of rhyme never got to share in it. On March 8, 1931, Henrietta Soyce Geisel died of brain cancer. She was 52 years old. Ted had been very close to his mother growing up, and she'd been very instrumental in, I think, encouraging him. And what he did was good, and, and he should do that. And uh, it was very hard. Shortly after their mother's death, Ted's beloved sister Marnie, newly divorced, moved back to Springfield with her daughter Peggy to care for their father. Feeling her own life had ground to a halt, Marnie spiraled into alcoholism and rarely left the house. Her father disapproved in customary fashion. He stopped speaking to her. She believed her brother's absence meant that he felt the same way. In 1945, at the age of 43, Marnie Geisel died of a heart attack at her childhood home. Guilt-ridden, Ted was unable to talk about it for the rest of his life. And I think there, there also was this thread of, could I have made a difference if I'd been around? And he wasn't, because he was moving on and in another part of America. But part of his protection, I think, was, was not to allow himself to spend his, his life in grief. And perhaps that's why he found such joy in doing the outrageous books he did. Ted dedicated his follow-up to Mulberry Street to an imaginary child he named Chrysanthemum Pearl. Due to an illness early in their marriage, Helen was unable to have children. Niece Peggy became a surrogate daughter. Years later, Ted and Helen hosted her wedding in their home. She didn't replace my mother. She didn't become my mother. But she gave me so much guidance without it being obvious. It was an example she set. You just wanted to be like someone who was very aware of other people's feelings. Her husband, an introvert by nature, would always depend on people who weren't. Bennett Cerf, famous wit and legendary publisher at Random House, understood before anyone else how modern media could turn authors into celebrities. Plus, my dad, I think, really brought something to Ted that Ted was good at, but had never figured out how to do. Ted knew how to sell flit, and he knew how to sell other things brilliantly, but he hadn't really sold himself the way my dad realized that he could sell Ted. Bennett told Ted that he would publish anything he did. Geisel tested him with his first Dr. Seuss book for an adult market one featuring the exploits of a band of nude women. The Seven Lady Godivas was an instant failure. Ted henceforth reserved his body humor for his friends. If you look at the end paper, there's a little bucket hanging from a branch, and uh, there's a little cut in the branch, and out of the cut comes a drop of sap, and the sap is labeled Bennett Surf. And this was Ted's comment on Bennett for publishing the book, so... <laughs> He obviously knew that it was a chancy uh, undertaking. But, of course, Bennett wanted to do it because that was the way he got Ted to Random House. And what a prize that was.